Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our afternoon uh, panel on inclusive teaching from a faculty perspective. My name is Hélène Frère Dourlan. I used to pronounce they, them, or she, her. And I work as an educational strategist for the Equity and Inclusion Office uh, in partnership with the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology here at UBC. I'll just let my colleague and I quickly introduce herself as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Hannah Itzkada. And I use gender pronouns, she, her, and hers. And uh, my role, um, I am an educational strategist with the Equity and Inclusion Office. And my role is embedded in the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. Great. And so um, to get us started, I just want to um, acknowledge that we're here today gathered on the um, unceded ancestral and traditional land of the Musqueam people, um, as well as for the folks who are uh, joining us via live stream in the Okanagan, uh, the territory of the Silex Nation. For me, I think that acknowledgement is really important for a couple of reasons. And the first thing is actually I would like to um, bring a link in from the student panel that we had yesterday where we heard from students about their perspective on inclusive teaching. And one of the things that stayed with me uh, that one of the students shared was the importance of seeing yourself acknowledged even in a small way. And so I think while land acknowledgements are not the sort of end all and be all of what it means to think about and to grapple with the reality of uh, living and working on unceded indigenous land, I think uh, they're also a necessary part of reminding ourselves of that reality and the responsibility that that carries in our everyday life. And so for myself, as uh, someone who is a settler, a fairly recent immigrant to Canada, and who came to Canada not having actually any understanding of this land as indigenous land, I've reflected a lot of where that lack of understanding and knowledge came from. And I think some of the conversations about inclusive teaching are about sort of that conversation, who gets included, who doesn't, but also um, who gets to do the including, right? And I think those conversations around land sovereignty and um, indigenous perspectives is very much also tied up in these similar questions. Um, so before we get started uh, formally with our event, I'd like to uh, uh, give a few shout outs to people who've made this event possible. Uh, first of all, a shout out to Kelly Fleming, who is the program lead for Celebrate Learning Week, uh, without whom this would never have happened. Uh, also the events team, was an incredible job of making sure that everything has been running smoothly in the last few days. Uh, and as someone who often runs events uh, by themselves, I am really grateful that there's actually a team supporting <laughs> us here. Uh, so I want to give them a shout out. And finally, I want to recognize that this event is made possible by the support and funding for, coming from the provost office for the whole of Celebrate Learning Week, not just this panel. Um, so that was the couple of things I wanted to touch upon. Uh, also, just a note that the event is being live streamed uh, at our campus in the Okanagan in Kelowna. Uh, so we'll, um, first of all, it's good to, uh, to remind our panelists also that that's happening, but also that will um, become important for the question and uh, question period. Uh, as we'll be asking for questions, not just from the audience here, but anyone who is uh, watching us from, uh, from Kelowna. Uh, the final thing that I wanted to say quickly, if Miriam, thank you, uh, is I wanted to take uh, this, uh, this panel as an opportunity to flag some of the work that has started on this campus and has been, in fact, ongoing on this campus for a long time around inclusive teaching. Uh, Hannah and I um, have been working for the last year on launching this website that's meant to be kind of a landing space for folks who are interested in hearing more and learning more about inclusive teaching. It's very much still a work in progress, so we would love um, if this is a resource that you find useful, that you would like to be able to use, uh, if you have some feedback on what's there, what you would like to see there, uh, it would be great to hear it. Um, and I think that kind of uh, is hopefully one of the pieces of a much larger conversation that we're trying to have on this campus around uh, what it means to bring equity and inclusion into our teaching and learning spaces. And on that note, I will pass it over to and I will introduce the session, okay. the agenda for the session. Yep. So just let me briefly introduce the, uh, the overview of the session. Uh, so um, before introducing our wonderful panelists and start the discussions, uh, we'd like to take a few minutes to, um, you know, to kind of uh, to highlight the work that is happening on campus to promote and support inclusive teaching at UBC. 
And to do so, uh, we invite um, Associate Vice President Equity and Inclusion, Sarah Jane Finley, to introduce a new program called uh, Equity and Inclusion Scholars Program, and the first cohort of scholars uh, selected for the program. And after that, uh, we will introduce faculty panelists and then begin panel discussions, and then followed by Q&A with audience. And with that, I'd like to uh, invite Sarah Jane to come and introduce the Equity and Inclusion Scholars Program. Thank you very much, Hanai. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to put my glasses on. This morning I was too vain to do that, and I then forgot to read half my script. So, um, and so I ended up speaking uh, from the heart rather than from the script. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the Equity and Inclusion Scholars Program and the scholars for the incoming cohort. Um, the ENI Scholars Program is a new awards program that aims to support and enhance equity, diversity, and inclusion in teaching and learning, with the ultimate aim of enhancing students' classroom experiences. Uh, the program's been developed by the Equity and Inclusion Office as part of our commitment to support existing efforts and to build capacity for deepening equity and inclusion in teaching contexts. Uh, it is supported by CTLT as part of their commitment to foster greater opportunities for inclusive teaching at UBC. Now, the funding for the ENI Scholars Program comes from the Commitment to Diversity Fund, which was advocated for by the student government in 2015 um, and was a commitment made by the Board of Governors. Uh, a central component of the ENI Scholars Program is to elevate existing efforts and to build capacity for furthering equity, diversity, and inclusion in teaching and learning. There are many, many good uh, EDI efforts going on uh, um, in teaching and learning spaces um, across UBC. And this program is one of the efforts to bring together individuals and units working on the issue from a range of different perspectives. So we're really happy to have selected um, six projects uh, in, that will be providing two years of funding. Um, these projects are situated across eight faculties, and there are 26 scholars connected to the six projects who range in rank from doctoral students through to full professors. Um, there's a strong collaboration between academic and non-academic units on campus, and half of the projects uh, include a strong community engagement learning component. Now, while the projects are diverse in scope and approach, they share in common a commitment to grappling with complex notions of inclusion or exclusion in teaching and learning. Some projects focus on building faculty capacity, others focus on the student experience. Proposed outputs of the projects range in approach, including curricular development, pedagogical interventions, resource development, assessment tools, and capacity building all at the interface of fostering greater potential for inclusion of students' learning experiences and in ways that can be applied in related disciplines. So now I'm going to introduce the um, scholars and a little bit about the projects. And um, if you're here, maybe just put your hand up when I, when I say it. So the first project is led by Neil Armitage and focuses on introducing community building education within two departments in order to develop resources that disciplines across arts can can embed to foster community building and student engagement. This collaborative and interdisciplinary project, led by uh, Mario Brondani, uses a community engagement approach to explore how interactive and open dialogue about issues of sexual diversity, addiction, and mental health within the undergraduate dental and dental hygiene curricula contribute to a transformative learning experience. This highly coordinated and collaborative project led by Tal Jaras focuses on creating inclusive and equitable practice processes, tools, and resources for supporting students with disabilities seeking accommodation during their practicum placements. Uh, led by the director of the ACAM program, I'm sure I saw Chris someplace, Chris Lee, the focus of this, uh, the, uh, the Sorry, led by Chris, the focus of this project is to build an interdisciplinary undergraduate curriculum that integrates equity, inclusion, and community engagement at all levels and aims to build capacity and foster community among teachers and scholars in Asian Canadian studies. Janice Stewart and Annette Henry lead this project, which is focused on developing teaching and learning resources that support faculty and administrators in their trajectory towards a professional and culturally competent approach to working with difficult and divisive issues across varied classroom settings. And then finally, a team of people from science um, comprised of Christine Goodhart, Karen Smith, Jared Stang, and Jacqueline Stewart will, through a system systematic assessment of characteristics of learning activities that support and engage students, 
enhance equity and intercultural understanding in three science courses. The research team will develop and test assessment tools that will inform best practices for educators when implementing learning activities in an active learning environment. Um, and it, could the scholars who are here please stand and we can uh, welcome and acknowledge them. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sarah Jing, for the, um, for the introduction. I'm actually, I feel like this is such a perfect thing that the, uh, the announcement lined up with this event because it really points at the breadth, actually, of the conversations that are happening on campus and that this is by no means just a conversation that's happening between our panelists, though we're very excited to hear what they have to say, but really something that's happening at the grassroots level in lots of different spaces on campus. So now I'd like to uh, introduce the panelists who are joining us today. Um, instead of me trying to speak to and for them, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves and maybe um, the couple of things that we'd like to hear uh, just to get a sense of who you are but also to get the conversation started really is um, if you could share your name, your pronouns, the role and um, uh, uh, place that you come from on this campus and also one reason why inclusive teaching is meaningful to you uh, and let's try and keep it pretty short so we can get into the depth of the conversation, but we'd love to hear a little bit of, um, of a, a glimpse into how you think about inclusive teaching to start. Um, and maybe we'll start over here. <laughs> um, my name is Christine Goodhart. I use the pronoun she, hers. Um, I am a science education specialist in the Department of Botany. And um, my interest in inclusive teaching really stems not from so much my current role, but from my previous role as a biology instructor at a community college in Los Angeles. Um, and I started off teaching very traditional with a textbook and um, lectures and exams and quizzes to assess my students and I found that it fell completely flat and that my students were not succeeding. Um, so I started to talk to them a little bit more and I started to delve into what the problems were and I found that a lot of my students first of all could not afford the textbook. I had a lot of homeless students, um, students that were very low socioeconomic status and without the textbook they were really at a big disadvantage. Um, the students that could afford a textbook ne couldn't necessarily use it because they didn't have time. Many of my students were taking care of children, other family members, working one, two, three jobs, uh, commuting one, two hours each way. I had students that were deathly afraid of the subject, um, that had very terrible test taking anxiety, that did not see themselves as scientists and didn't see how it related to their lives. So I had to completely change my course structure to better meet their needs. Um, to better set themselves up for success. Uh, and in particular, one thing that I did in addition to throwing out the textbook and changing how I covered concepts to make it more interesting to them is to incorporate scientist spotlights where I would highlight scientists that actually were relatable to students and represented the different identities of students. For example, I had a lot of um, students that were religious that didn't think that science and religion went together, so I incorporated scientists that were religious. I incorporated incorporated women scientists and um, scientists of ethnicities that represented my students. And um, my students did a lot better and were a lot more engaged and excited about the topic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Gebramuse. I'm an assistant professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law. Um, I use the pronouns she and her. Um, before I uh, get into a discussion of why inclusive teaching is important to me. I just wanted to thank the organizers for the invitation. I'm fairly new addition to the law school, um, just joined last year, so it's great to be included and invited in spaces like this. Um, inclusive teaching is important and meaningful for me because um, as a black woman going through the Canadian education system and particularly the legal education system in this country, I never really saw myself reflected um, in the course material, in the professors who were teaching uh, to me. And so the opportunity to stand before a Canadian legal classroom um, and to teach very old colonial material but in a more nuanced and innovative way um, is why inclusive teaching is meaningful for me because without inclusive teaching I think we undermine the existence of so many students who are in the classroom and so many students who are seeking to, to enter the legal classroom because it is still a, a program, 
um, and a profession that has yet to fully reflect the Canadian population. So uh, inclusive teaching is important to me so that we can um, ensure there's greater equity uh, in the legal profession and in law schools across the country. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Manal Matani. I use the pronouns she and hers. And uh, uh, yeah, I also want to thank the organizers. It's such a special event, so thank you for including me. Uh, why is inclusive teaching important to me? Uh, plainly put, because I got kicked out of university in my first year. I did not do well. I did not feel seen. When I did feel seen, I felt hyper-visible as a Muslim woman of Indian-Iranian descent. So as I was to point out the fact that I was different, and Manal, can you please speak about your difference? that kind of thing, or else nobody was even acknowledging the fact that uh, my experiences were not reflected in any part of the curriculum whatsoever. So why do I do this? Because I don't want any student to feel the way that I did my first year at University of Toronto, and it's very ironic, I ended up going back to the very same school in the very same classrooms in which I was kicked out of all those years later. I've been at University of Toronto for the last 15 years and just joined UBC this year. So that's why I do it, is because I really don't want any student to go through what I went through. Bonjour, uh, Anin. Welcome to Megan Edition of Cas. Kevin Lamaru. Um, very proud to be part of the University of Winnipeg and to be visiting here in Vancouver. I was thinking, as uh, my colleagues were sharing, that in Anishinaabe language, Anishinaabe Moen, um, there is no gender pronouns. There are, uh, there are assumptions about gender. Gender is much more fluid from Anishinaabe perspectives. Uh, this idea of two-spiritedness is actually held quite sacred. The um, Agokwe of community were held in high esteem and high respect. And um, for a number of Ojibwe people, I believe that uh, the imposition of gender binary and uh, sexual orientation is a colonial imposition. But I very much enjoy hearing from people to know how they would like to be addressed so that I can conduct myself with respect and love accordingly. It's um, a pleasure to be a part of this panel. I'm humbled by the expertise and the personalities that I get to sit with. What a great gift I have in my life. Um, I come from um, the Eagle Clan, and in Ojibwe perspective, um, Eagle represents love. And I come from a grandparents who, when I was a very young boy, ran a boarding house uh, for people coming from northern Manitoba that needed to receive medical care so that they could be in a safe place while they were getting things like dialysis and other procedures that, again, were a consequence of poverty and oppression in northern Manitoba. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to come from those people. Uh, when I think about everything that I want for my own daughter, uh, wealth and well-being and all those other things, if, if she became the kind of person that sheltered sick people when they needed a safe place to go, I would be so proud of her. And so it's in accordance with the teachings of my clan um, that I try to conduct myself with love and. Uh, a sense of um, obligation mm, to my brothers and sisters. And I suppose that's my uh, interest in this. But more than anything, I'm very interested to learn from the people I sit with today. Oh, miigwech. Hi. Um, my name is Aftab Erfan. Um, I am a first generation immigrant from Iran. And in my language, also, there's no gender-specific pronouns. Uh, if you must speak to me in English, I'll go by she and her. Um, I am um, mainly right now working at the Equity and Inclusion Office as the Director of Dialogue and Conflict Engagement for the university, which means I do 10% dialogue and 90% conflict engagement, some of which happen uh, in, in classrooms or around things that happen in classrooms having to do with equity and inclusion. Um, my teaching is uh, in the Faculty of Applied Science at the School of Community and Regional Planning. But I'm a social scientist in engineering, so it's kind of, I'm not a typical uh, applied science uh, professor, I don't think. Um, the question of how, why is, why is inclusive teaching meaningful to me? Um, my, my therapist has noticed that uh, the central thing that I get caught on or the thing, that's, the thing that's important to me is integrity. It's not safety or success, but it's integrity. Um, and I think this has to do with integrity. I mean, in, in a way, um, UBC promotes itself as this place for equity and inclusion. We talk about that commitment. We talk about ourselves as a global place. Uh, we talk about our commitment to decolonizing. Um, and I think unless we are reflecting that in how we are teaching in the classroom and what we are teaching in the classroom, uh, 
it's, it's false advertisement. And there's something that feels very troubling to me. It feels out of integrity when we do that. Um, at the planning school specifically, we have um, an indigenous planning stream that we've had for the past five or six years. And, you know, we quite, um, we, I was going to say kind of ambitiously or even aggressively recruit indigenous students. And so to then expect that they just come in and nothing changes does not really work. So again, I feel like to have integrity, uh, we need to pay specific attention to this. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Benjamin Chung. Uh, pronouns, uh, my preferred pronouns are uh, he, him, and his. And uh, I'm a lecturer in the Department of, uh, of Psychology, a uh, relatively new addition, I guess, to the department as of three years ago. And um, inclusive teaching is important to me because uh, my, my wife said to me one time, it seems like whenever I ask you how your day is doing, it's centered around your students. Uh, if your students are crying in your office, then you, had a, then you tell me you had a bad day. If your students are excited about what you did today, then you had a really good day. Um, and uh, often, you know, a lot of my experiences in, in, in interacting with my students have to do with um, uh, students who either are crying because of the mental health issues, because of uh, cultural dynamics that they're dealing with at home, uh, or they are thanking me through tears just simply because I told them they can have an extension on their assignment and they don't need to give me a doctor's note or anything for it. Um, and it has really highlighted to me just how important it is to be considerate and inclusive um, of students uh, in, in a variety of our teaching practices. Uh, so with that in mind, I try to make sure to carry that in my, uh, in my teaching as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Wendy Carr. I'm from the Faculty of Education. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, this year, I, I've, I've held a number of administrative positions as well as, as teaching for a very long time uh, in the Faculty of Education and in K-12 schools. This year, I'm a senior advisor to the dean in charge of two really exciting areas, and one of them is uh, sexual and gender diversity and inclusion, and the other is mental health literacy. And there's some very interesting uh, overlaps between those two portfolios, as you might imagine. Something that we're really working hard on in the Faculty of Education, and have been putting quite a bit of effort in the last couple of years, is building uh, a culture, uh, a community, where our language, our curricula, our practices, our structures uh, can really uh, encourage or enable everyone to see themselves. We've heard that from a few people today. And um, Kevin, thank you for the inspirational start to the day with your keynote. Uh, that was also a theme. We want uh, different forms of knowledge, different ways of knowing, different ways of living one's life and experiencing one's identity to be um, not only acknowledged but actualized while in our program. We're in the really fortunate position of preparing teachers to become educators, uh, preparing uh, teacher candidates to go begin their careers as teachers, about 800 of them per year. So it's a potential to have a profound influence uh, systemically. And so how we shape our program in the Faculty of Education very much can influence how individual educators go out into the world of teaching and in some cases start to uh, reverse some of the harms of marginalization and discrimination, particularly in the areas of sexual orientation and gender identity. So I come, uh, we, we value all areas of human rights and those really predicate our policies and practices and we have a particular focus on preparing new teachers so that they feel included in our program and can learn to inculcate that, that sense of inclusion in their teaching. So it's a real pleasure to be here today. I do not do my work alone. Uh, Hélène um, Fouard-Julain has done a lot of work with us. Steve Mulligan is in the audience and has, is a seconded educator who helps to really create this sense of culture. And we're working closely with Janice Stewart uh, and Janice has done some formidable work uh, laying the groundwork, as has equity and inclusion. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. All right.
Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so uh, we'd like to start um, our panel discussions, and then maybe I can put on the names of the panelists in case people are sitting in the far back, in the back. Um, just so that you can see all the names of the panelists. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. um, so before we begin the discussions, um, and just to let, let you know how we structure the conversation in this kind of coming one hour, uh, we have prepared some discussion questions for the panelists. So we are going to have that question, um, you know, discussions with panelists. And we have asked everyone on the panel to kind of speak from their own teaching experience and perspectives. And, um, and also, um, yesterday we had a wonderful student panel event. And then in, on that panel, uh, I think five students spoke really eloquently about their experiences in the classroom, what it's like to be in the classroom and then feeling being included, or sometimes not so included, or sometimes it's worse. Uh, so we would like to bring that conversation to this panel discussion as well. So we are going to include some of the questions um, in the panel discussion. And then after that, uh, we, we will invite everyone from the audience in this room and also on the live stream to join the Q&A with the panelists. And um, so we have this hashtag CLW2019. Uh, and, um, and also, if you are shy and would rather want to participate in the Q&A from this room, you are well, more than welcome to participate through the uh, Twitter. So with that, uh, we'd like to start. So uh, thank you very much for your introductions and then sharing some thoughts about inclusive teaching. And then some of you might have already kind of touched on the, the, the question that I'm going to ask. But maybe you could kind of elaborate on the definition of inclusive teaching. When we talk about inclusive teaching, what does it mean? And if you, you know, just coming up with the definition is a little too much, then maybe what makes it inclusive teaching? What are the key elements? Well, I, I can jump in, and I know everyone will piggyback uh, on this. Uh, just a few ideas to, to start. When we think of our curricula and how we, which is often the first, and, and even our syllabi, the first sort of compact, the first contract into which we enter with students, uh, we need to think about how we're representing what it is students are going to experience in our courses whose knowledge is represented and valued, who are the writers, for example, that are uh, featured in your course, how do you structure engagement, because different groups engage in different ways, and so even how your evaluation structure uh, sometimes highlights or foregrounds particular ways of engagement. Um, is there an inclusion, an inclusion statement in your syllabus, for example? So the, these ways of beginning to look at curriculum uh, were part of a curriculum mapping exercise that we did in, in our faculty. I think the way that um, students will see themselves begins with our, our actual curriculum. And then it moves to the language and the practices in the uh, teaching environment. Uh, how we speak and write people into existence and out of existence is very much something we need to be conscious of from the very first contact that we have with our, our students uh, throughout the process. Uh, because again, we're always modeling for them. We're always, every interaction is, is not only in and of itself significant, but it's the witnessing of that interaction that has this ripple effect. And so we live inclusion through our practices and we model for our students and for others observing us uh, what we value. So that would be a way to kick off, I think. Thank you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. Anyone else to jump in? Or maybe differently, what do you do in your classroom? You know, maybe share your concrete examples of what you may intentionally do to make that classroom environment more inclusive of people. I think um, the big thing for me in, in, in uh, my classrooms anyway is that people feel welcome and safe in participating in class. 
Uh, and you know, I, I, I think I appreciate the fact that uh, this forum is allowing for people to go on Twitter, for instance, and participate uh, if they are feeling shy or anxious to speak in, in public in front of all these people. In psychology, our classrooms are anywhere between 90 people to 300 people in a single classroom. And you can imagine speaking in front of 299 other students can be extremely daunting. Um, so my classes on average are about, about 150 students. Um, and so uh, I've, I've had a lot of students who will come up to me individually afterwards and, and, and ask questions and make comments about the course, about the content that we just discussed. Uh, but there would have been so much more um, uh, it would have been so much more productive to have had that conversation in the midst of the class where we can actually talk about those ideas. Uh, so in, in, in uh, my class, I have this, I have this question box. Um, and, it's a little, and it's a little box that off in the corner of the room where people, if they feel like they're uncomfortable with speaking up in class, at the end of the class, they can you know, put in a little slip of paper that is anonymous uh, and drop it in. And then um, at the end of the day, I'll collect the box, I'll take a look at the questions that are there, and I'll bring it up at the next class. And then we can have a discussion about that without having to, whoops, without having to name anyone. Sorry, I got too excited. Um, <laughs> without having to really name anyone or out anyone as having asked that question. And we get really fruitful ex uh, discussions coming from that. And so you know, just finding ways to include more people into the discussion is really what we're trying to do, and it's really what's, what's needed um, in, in our classrooms. Um, there, there's a lot of other policies that I don't want to take up too much time. But there's a lot of other policies that I, I try to do in my classroom where we, the, the goal really is to welcome students um, and to make people feel like they belong um, and not like, not visible in the way that Manel unfortunately experienced uh, in, in university. Um, but to make people feel like they have something to contribute in a way that is meaningful um, in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And in creating kind of different ways of, for students to yeah. participate, that's yeah. something uh, I can hear from a lot of um, educators. But anyone else to add? Broad, broadly speaking, I would consider inclusive teaching to be meeting students where they are. Mm -hmm. And this ultimately, I think, will look very different in different people's classrooms, depending on who your students are, the, the context of your course, what your strengths are as an instructor, and your, maybe your weaknesses are as an instructor. Um, but it's going to look different. Uh, and I think that the key thing is to get to know your students. If you know your students, then you'll be able to better set up a classroom environment in which your course content, materials, um, curriculum, teaching practices are interesting, relatable, accessible to everyone in the course. Um, thank you, Christine. Is there anything you particularly do to get to know your students, where they are at? Because that's something I often hear, and yes. everyone seems to have different strategies to get to know their students, you know, depending on the size of the class, you know, when you have 100 students in the class or many students, mm -hmm. can you share something? Or? Yeah, definitely. Um, having interact interactive activities during your course is a really great way to get to know your students because you can walk around especially you can walk to the back of the room where the students tend to probably you engage with them less um, and they're probably the students that you need to hear from most uh, also I've heard we are currently in, engaging in a student diversity initiative in um, the Faculty of Sciences and I've been doing some student interviews and what I hear over and over and over from students is that they want to interact with their, with their instructors. They want to have um, actual physical interactions with you, um, but they don't always feel like they can. So being approachable, being friendly, and um, something else that, that, that they talk about is uh, sharing about yourself talking about your own struggles and, and showing your students that you're a person 
makes them more likely to want to engage with you and um, trust you and, and, and tell you a little bit about themselves. I can pick up uh, from that. Um, I think I, I kind of think of a two-piece approach. One is in the design and what do they read and what does the course content cover. Uh, and then there's the stuff that happens when I'm standing in front of the room. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if I'm honest, I mean, in the preparation design, I am thinking about different identities. How would this land for my queer students? Am I speaking to examples that uh, have the immigrant community? Like, I do think about that in the preparation. Uh, but when I'm standing in front of a room, what I'm most conscious of is including um, things below the neck, <laughs> like, you know, that, that there is heart in the discussion, that the, the body is present, that there is, identity is a thing that we can talk about. Um, in some way, I feel like the most colonial thing about our institution is that we are from the neck up. Uh, and so when I really think about how to be inclusive, that's what I'm being inclusive of most consciously. And part of it is exactly what you're talking about, of coming in as a person um, and, and uh, sharing a little bit more personally um, and going to the back of the room, which is like you have to have a body to go to the back of the room. You know, it doesn't, ha it doesn't just happen in the realm of ideas. Um, so yeah, I think it manifests in those ways, but just kind of in terms of where my attention is, it's like meeting every person as, um, well, really, like holders of knowledge and wisdom, and in, and and involving all of that, or inviting all of that into the discussions in the classroom. Anyone wants to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in. Or like yesterday, um, one of the student Some panelists teacher. was talking yeah, about, you know, jump. sometimes you know their peers speak, just you know they're just uninformed. Some in, um, <laughs> You know, you know, just thinking about you know meeting where students are at. Students come from all different places and different educational backgrounds, and then students bring in different kind of levels of skills and knowledge and different forms of knowledge as well. Um, and and yet sometimes you know students come with this uninformed idea about something and then you know carry on the discussions and 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 the students' expectations are you know they want instructors to you know, say something and then to kind of facilitate that conversation, you know, whatever the comments raised there. Um, and often, you know, educators do talk about, you know, meet students where they're at, but at the same time, it's a really a challenging task. For example, you know, in the classroom, when, you know, I, when I came to Canada, there was no, like, I didn't really know anything about residential schools, right? I, I am I'm an international student. Um, then, you know, but students, other students talking about, in, residential schools and then, you know, if I say something really, un, you know, uninformed or just even say, what is it? What, what is it about? And how do you facilitate that space? Do you have to, you know, if you are talking about inclusive classroom, then how do you facilitate that kind of space? Any experience or insights? Well, that, that's part of the art of teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's something more often than not, so preparing teachers, that's a question that comes up. You know, how do we take students from where they are and, and enlighten, move them along? Because remember, it's not just enlightening that student, it's what's going on for every other student in the space at that time, because they're listening and learning and watching. Um, so you have to respectfully uh, honor where they are, uh, consider the background that brought them to that thinking, uh, and perhaps there are some gaps as well as some, some richness. Well, there are there's obviously, I, I really appreciate thinking of them as, as vessels, obviously. Uh, they have their own resources. Respecting that and moving them forward in their thinking. And so that can take the form of uh, provocative questions. You know, have you thought about uh, I wonder questions? You can get a lot into an I wonder question. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a skill. And it's not easy. And uh, that's why becoming a teacher takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we can then just shift the conversation a little bit to think about, so, you know, you 
kind of in, in the introductions, you talked about why inclusive teaching matters. And then, so then, what about the impact on students? What impact are you trying to really, you know, have on students' learning? Why, you know, what it matter? And also, yesterday from the um, student panel, after that, some uh, people from the audience contributed this question about how do we know that it's working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'll go with yes. that, if that's okay. Um, I come at this from, with a very different perspective on teaching, because I've been out of the academy for the last five years. I've been, I'm a geography and journalism professor, but I've been hosting a radio show in downtown Vancouver for the last four years called Sense of Place. So I've spent the last five years like asking people questions every day, all day, like you know, 10 to 12, or, and it's been fantastic. But it made me really think about the power of questions. I'm so glad, Wendy, that you brought up this issue of questions because it's top of mind for me these days. Um, and it made me think more about listening and how I'm not a very good listener. <laughs> and here I am as a radio host, I'm expected to listen, but I was too busy trying to think of a great question than listening to the answers that I was receiving. So it made me start thinking about listening as not just a political act, but as a pedagogical act. And how could I encourage a different kind of listening? I mean, again, I was so struck by Kevin's powerful uh, keynote today, where he talked at the very beginning about how we listen or how we don't listen and what we're, how, what we're paying attention to. And it made me think, how can I structure a class as I embark upon my first time teaching at the Institute for Social Justice here on UBC that would encourage students to listen in a different way? And I told that powerful story at the beginning about what, like for me, at least it was powerful because it was so gut-wrenchingly difficult at University of Toronto. Because for me, that's really been the inspiration for thinking about the development of this course. And I have the pleasure of teaching a course called GRSJ 101, which is a course on introduction to social justice. And in this course, I've really been trying to think through um, what Cornell West tells us, which is social justice is just what love looks like in public. Hmm. And I can't stop thinking about that. It's just like top of mind for me. So I wanted to think about how I could bring that into the classroom. So, I structured a course that looked at the question of geographies of inspiration and violent epistemologies. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but what that really means <laughs> is I want to ask what inspires us to learn, what inspires us to listen, what gets us excited about ideas. And so the way I structured the course was simply like this. Every week I'd bring in a different guest speaker. That speaker would give two articles for us to read. What is the piece that inspired them. You know when you're in school and you read a piece, you're like, oh my god, this is why I went into graduate school. It's like this one article. Mm -hmm. But we also read a piece by that person that they wrote, the one that they felt epitomizes their career, the one that they really worked hard on to get just right. The students read both and had to make the links in terms of what was inspirational from the piece that they read and the piece that they wrote. And then I interviewed that person for an hour and a half every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And the dynamic was incredible because, as you say, we all want to get to know our professors, but we often don't get a chance to do that. And that's why this is a first year course, because the students can hear me talk about the themes of, the themes that I talked about were risk, relation, revolution, repair. What are the risks we take in teaching? How do we think about revolution? What does relationality really mean? And what is our duty to repair? Mm -hmm. So we talked about this for the first hour. And then on the Thursday, they would meet in a groups of 10, 10 students in each group and they would talk about what they learned in the class. This experience was transformational for me. I mean, look, I get to interview all these really cool professors on campus, but it's also about the students developing relationships with the professors that are here, and there are such talented professors here on campus. But they don't often share their personal story, their trajectory, and hearing the stories of trauma, like what they went through in university, you would not believe the stories that came up in class, the honesty, the openness with which they share their stories but the students could see themselves reflected in those people speaking. Completely changed the classroom in a way that I hadn't anticipated. Now, I think one thing that's really important for me in the classroom, it's not just what I'm doing at the front of the classroom, but I also like to think about how I'm integrating some of these kinds of principles into adjudication. So one of the things that I did is I asked the students for their final paper to write a letter to the speaker. One speaker that they thought was pretty, that uh, really moved them. So I've just spent the last three days adjudicating all these letters to speakers, and they have been extraordinarily moving and powerful. Why do I do this? Not because I just want them to reflect on it, but also because I actually want them to send those letters, because then they can develop a relationship with some of those professors, mm -hmm. and perhaps even take a course with them, do a directed reading course with them. Mm -hmm. 
So that's my example of right, how I'm trying to do this in the classroom and how that's been very, at least been very transformational for me, but certainly from the students, from the feedback I've been getting, it's, it's altered their way they've understood their own trajectory in the university so far. I'm so glad, Miguel, that you are talking about like, you know, students need to relate to the content and they need to see themselves in it because yesterday at the stu on the student panel, students did talk about you know, how much it's important for them to be able to see themselves and then have their voice being reflected or be, you know, or given the voice, right? Like when they didn't have the voice. So it's really wonderful. Mm. In the comments about the impact I think what's important to consider often is that undergrads don't know what academia is like, um, and they don't know how to navigate their ways around university, university politics, university dynamics, um, and the the rules and the, the that are spoken and unspoken um, that they just don't know, um, and 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 like I. I've, like there are students who don't know to ask for extensions at all, um, and I, I had a student. I, I've had I had I had one particular student uh, that I'm thinking in my mind right now who uh, major uh, honors and a major, trying to do it in four years because of family reasons, and uh, was stressed beyond means, um, trying to accomplish everything in that term with like papers and exams almost simultaneously. And, and, and I said to the student, you know, you can ask me for an extension. I can give you an extension. That's fine. Like you have all this other stuff that you need to deal with. You, you need to, you know, you need to, you need to be okay. Um, and the response was from the student was, really, is that, is that okay? And I, I, was, I was shocked just, just because, so this is a first generation university student. Um, and, and it's sort of not surprisingly, there's not a lot of scaffolding that was able to happen within the family on like how do you manage your time and how do you manage your mental health and well-being in university? How do you manage the people that you'll meet, that you'll come into, uh, that you come across in university? Um, and, and so, over time, and sort of just having these kinds of relations, having these dialogues with the students, and, and you know, sharing your own experiences, and sharing what you know about university dynamics and academia dynamics, that the, the students, you sort of almost empower students to be able to take more of the control that they really should have, um, but they often don't realize that they have, uh, to make the university experience uh, one that they can actually enjoy, one that they can actually thrive in. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's difficult for people without that scaffolding, without that experience. That reminds me of the keynote speech this morning. Kevin was talking about flexibility and kindness to students and you know, giving a space for it. Um, anything else to add to it? Otherwise, we can kind of shift a little bit the gear towards kind of you know, as the UVC, um, you know, kind of walks towards structural way of embedding equity and inclusion into different areas of work that UVC does, like, and then teaching and learning is definitely one of the big areas uh, where we want to embed that, and then we want to kind of hear more of the, your thoughts, and then I'll pass this kind of part of the discussion sure. to Ellen. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, I, maybe just before moving on to the, those kinds of more structural pieces, I'm, I'm um, curious to hear, uh, jumping off on a couple of things that were said, and one of the things that strikes me is um, the mentorship piece that I think, Manel, you spoke to and sort of the way that you were scaffolding that into your, um, your exercises or the trajectory of your class, rather. Um, and that's actually something that also came up yesterday in the student panel. A, a couple of students spoke directly to the importance of mentorship or the absence of mentors or not knowing sort of where to find mentors. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak to your experiences with mentorships um, of students. What does that look like? And, um, and the tensions around that. We had one student yesterday specifically who, um, who said that she struggled um, as a racialized student, you know, looking for mentors that reflected who she is and, and to whom she was drawn, but also being very aware that often uh, 
faculty who themselves have experiences of marginalization are often, um, I think she said, oversubscribed yeah. or, right? And so how do you balance that? And Aftab, you had a beautiful answer yesterday, I think, to that student directly. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious about that conversation mm -hmm. and if um, you wouldn't mind speaking to some of those experiences in, in your lives as, as instructors. Mm -hmm. I can start with what I said yesterday <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, from the audience to the student. What I said, which came really clearly at the moment, was I think it's, it's um, one of the most moving things that happened to me when a student asks for mentorship, and especially when they say very specifically, it's like, I would like you to be my mentor, and right. this kind of uses that word maybe even. Um, I mean, there's nothing more meaningful than that in, in, in a lot of our roles, and especially for, for those as faculty who um, struggle with being in front of the class and our own issues of marginalization and having to deal with all these structural things. And often the students are the best thing, uh, the best part of the job. And um, so my encouragement was, was actually to ask for it because also I'm not oversubscribed. I think there, there's a, I can see my students protecting me in a way and, and being like, well, I, I want it, but like probably everybody wants her to be their mentor and actually not many of them are asking me. I don't know if it's just me or if that's more generalizable. Uh, but I would, I would actually like to be asked. And as I was thinking of it overnight, um, I actually think I, I would like it to become even a little more formalized. I mean, there's right. already something in the calling it mentorship that formalizes it beyond the, uh, you know, I want to cry in the hallway and I, I need somebody to listen. Like, mentorship gives me um, a place from which to express my care and hold that longer term relationship mm -hmm. right. um, and maybe ideally to also get credit for that you know like because right. the, the the sort of the um, overextension the emotional labor that like that's a real thing and um, maybe some of the mentorship if it is named and acknowledged could be also accounted for um, formally I can speak to uh, an example in, uh, in education, uh, and it's, it's, um, it's perhaps not a formalized mentorship, say, as, as working with a grad student, but um, our undergrads, our teacher candidates, come to our program with degrees. Um, and they come from really diverse backgrounds, not only personally, but uh, in terms of a academically, as well as having had many lived experiences between their undergrad and coming into our program. Often what our work as mentors, and I know Steve has done this work as well, um, particularly with our uh, LGBTQ2 plus students, is helping them to navigate uh, unwelcoming terrain. And that can be, for example, in a very conservative K-12 uh, classroom. And there are lots of those. Um, education can attract a certain and, and inculcate a certain conservatism. And so um, those who are different, however we want to term, or define that, and Kevin, I liked how you physically drew a line in the ground to say us and, or, and them. So if you consider yourself to be a them and you're going into an unwelcome environment, we as mentors, that's one of, I think, the strongest uh, gifts we can give to students is to help them to navigate that terrain, is how to hold your own ground how to hold who you are and work within structures that are often very unwelcoming. And there are ways through, and typically we, if we've made it here, have figured out some of those ways through. And so sometimes that can be the most powerful teaching uh, we can share with our students. And uh, you know, we've heard enough feedback from, from candidates, particularly navigating the terrain in a K-12 school. It's very different from a UBC classroom. Uh, that some of those tips, some of those assurances that they're not going to lose their identity, they can just shift for a little while and then resume um, once they're in a more secure role, for example. That can be very helpful for students. Piggybacking on that, I'm actually curious to hear um, uh, from both law and science for slightly mm -hmm. different reasons. Law, because it's another professional program which I think raises slightly different questions right around not just mentorship within teaching and learning spaces, but potentially moving on to a career in a particular field. 
And actually, in some ways, similarly in science, I think there's been um, efforts sometimes at formal men mentorship, usually aimed at women, right? And I'm kind of curious if you can both speak to um, your experiences with these both informal and formal opportunities and the impact that you've seen that had and, and where you'd maybe like to see more happen. Um, so, uh, to your point, Ellen, mentorship in, in law is, is critical because right. um, to borrow Ben's language, there really isn't a lot of scaffolding for certain groups right. who are pursuing legal education. Um, and so in my personal experience, I, I sought out mentors um, as much as possible and not only turned to um, lawyers or law professors that look like me, but also to, to other professors that were either doing work in similar areas of interest. Um, and oftentimes it, it wasn't as successful as I had hoped it would be. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I mean, oftentimes I think it was because those profs didn't really think that, um, especially those in academia, that, that academia was in store for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, why, if they don't see me as sort of that shining star of a student, right. why bother mentoring and lifting up the student to the mm -hmm. potential that I was hoping to achieve? Um, and so that has really shaped my um, experience now um, as a professor. Um, I'm joining the ranks of a profession that I never really thought I would, um, just because, again, I didn't really see myself reflected in this profession. Um, and unfortunately, the private practice of law, which I didn't really want to pursue to begin with, even though it paid really well, um, also didn't have much luck once I gained more and more graduate legal education. Um, and so now as a professor and the only black professor at the law school, um, I do, of course, have an, a natural affinity to helping uh, the, black, the few black law students that uh, are studying here um, because I, I recall what it was like being a black student, one of the few black faces um, in a law school, um, and trying to navigate a predominantly white um, institution, a predominantly white profession, um, and, and what that would entail. And so I've, through whatever efforts I can, have supported the, the students in, I would say it's been mostly informal because we just haven't given a title to it at the law school. Um, and so I've uh, reached out to, they've, the students are organized. There's a Black Law Students Association and they try to organize a number of different events during the year. So I support them in any capacity um, that I can. Um, it would be great to see that type of support be formalized because as I completed my annual report for the first time. I was like, where do I put this work? That took up so much, so many hours. And I was like, it's really just like a footnote at the end of the report. Um, so it would be great to see it formalized and to see the type of work that so many marginalized professors do um, to be recognized. And if I can just quickly make a connection to, again, something I said this morning in your keynote, Kevin, around seeing past the struggle to seeing the potential, I think uh, that really resonated with what you just shared sort of getting um, like professors kind of deciding right from the get-go, are you someone that I see as uh, having potential or not, mm -hmm. right? And thinking from um, once you're in that instructor position, think about what is shaping who we see as having potential and who we see mm -hmm. as not having as much potential and then maybe like, being less deserving of our time or attention. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your share. Mm -hmm. You want to speak to us, or I didn't mean to put the two of you on the spot. I just automatically was drawn to kind of those spaces. I think as interesting spaces for mentorship. Yeah, um, I can really only speak to the biology program, um, but as far as what came out of the interviews that I've been doing with students, is they are they really would like more mentorship that comes out over and over and over again in the interviews, and it's something that we're thinking about. So we're in the process of a curriculum renewal project uh, and it's something that we actually want to integrate into the curriculum a little bit more just because we are seeing that there's such a need for it um, and we want to build that capacity within maybe the curriculum. That's actually a, a really interesting sort of tie-in to another question that we had which is around sort of structural supports right so we've been talking um, not only but uh, somewhat to sort of what it is like to be an instructor or a student trying to make those connections and trying to create that space in a classroom. But to a large extent, that's also um, set up within a larger context, right, of the institution, of the university. And so not having room, right, in an annual report to speak to some of that work 
shapes then whether or not that work is appealing work to do because you know that you're not going to get recognized for it. And so I'm curious if um, some of you can speak to what you would they, what you see as either promising practices that are happening in your departments and faculties or um, pr practices that you'd like to see implemented, right, in terms of building in that recognition for whether it's um, mentorship, whether it's emotional labor that instructors are often called to do, or um, inclusive teaching practices more broadly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was introduced to a theory by an uh, academic by the name of John Ogbu out of the United States who talked about his experience working with African American students in the United States. Uh, and he talked about this idea of a forced choice dilemma, mm -hmm. where the phenomenon when we find students in a situation where they have to choose between being successful at school mm -hmm. or being loyal to their home community. Mm -hmm. And really what it comes down to is a conflict of values and a conflict of identity. Um, and to really understand that, I suppose, from a Canadian perspective, I had to really reflect on the truth that the primary weapon used against Indigenous students, for example, was uh, mainstream public education and the academy. And, and being in a situation where you have to choose between perhaps pursuing a pathway to success as defined by other or being loyal to your home community, that's a real tension. And I think it kind of speaks to this idea of uh, uh, well, mentorship and, and some of the structural you know, questions that we have in place around what we're offering students it really goes down to the idea of values and, and what's the point, right? Um, when I was uh, decided that I was going to pursue my PhD, I went to my elders, my knowledge keepers, to share this with them. And the first question that they asked me was why? And the reason that they wanted to know why I wanted to pursue a PhD is because they wanted to know what I was going to do with that knowledge. Why are you pursuing it? Um, and they asked that question because that was going to determine whether or not I was going to get support from the community in that pursuit. Mm -hmm. If the purpose for pursuing it was to get three letters after my name that allowed me a certain sort of arrogance or hubris or a certain sort of leverage over other human beings and there was no support from my community for pursuing that education. If the point was to do something with that uh, knowledge, to enter into relationship with that knowledge and enter into a place of responsibility for that knowledge, then we could open up the conversation for how the community might support me in that regard. And I'll just give you an example of this. Um, several years ago, I had a cancer scare. I uh, went to go have a regular dentist checkup, and my dentist found a growth in my jaw. And I don't mean this to, to gross you out or anything like that. It's for illustrative purposes only. Um, but I found this growth, and uh, so they took some x-rays, and the dentist took a look at the x-rays, and when he came back, he put the x-rays up on, the, on the, the lighting wall, you know, and the first thing he said was, yeesh, and I thought, well, that's not really filling me with a lot of confidence <laughs> no, there, doctor. And so he sent me to a specialist, and, and was determined that I was going to have to have surgery to have this growth removed out of my jaw, and so I went in for, uh, for surgery, and while I was sitting there, you know, in that fantastic gown where your butt hangs out the back, <laughs> waiting for this procedure, um, the anesthesiologist came in who was in a big rush, uh, and I was nervous, um, because I haven't had a lot of medical procedures, and uh, I was just intimidated by the situation. And he, uh, he said, you got two choices. You can have a spinal, you can have general anesthesia. One might give you brain damage. The other might paralyze you. Which one do you want? And I said, I don't know, doctor. Which one would you recommend? And he said, it's not my choice. It's yours. But you've got to make a decision quick because I've got other patients. Oh, God. And I said, I guess I'll take the brain damage package. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what else to, to really suggest. And I was horrified afterwards. I remember being so scared my hands were shaking. And a nurse came up to me and very kindly assured me that they have to say that for legal purposes, that um, it had nothing to do with uh, you know, anything that I needed to be worried about. Everything was going to be fine. I'm sure that anesthesiologist got A-pluses on his work. It doesn't matter. There's something missing in his pursuit of well-being and health for, for people that he was intended to serve. And so it goes back to this idea of what's the point. If it's to hold leverage over other human beings, um, then the values are inconsistent with at least any indigenous community that I've ever interacted with. I think you raise a good question also with the story around what are we assessing and for what purpose, right, which we can get into. But um, yeah, is, what do we determine as being a successful, right, obtaining a successful degree and what does it look like, that career along the way? 
Does anyone else have um, examples or thoughts around this idea of how do we create some of these formal um, supports for efforts around equity and inclusion in, in teaching and learning? I don't know if it's a ask for formal support, but um, just as we were talking about assessment and adjudication and evaluation, um, I've also been marking papers for the past three days. <laughs> we finished two days ago. <laughs> I was time of year now, but um, but it was like the question was up for me so often. Of what am I doing as I evaluate oh, these right. papers? And uh, I mean, maybe I'll share my struggle because in, in some way, what I would love is communities of practice of people who talk about these things and, and right. can bounce ideas off mm -hmm. of each other. And my struggle as a, so the assignment was a, essentially a literature review. It was not maybe, and not, it may be part of the problem, although I made it very broad. It doesn't have to be literature, literature. It could, like, blogs would count, and videos would count, and stories would count that you hear firsthand. So it was very broad. It could be in any format. But as I was reading it, I was aware that some of the students, um, and actually I was maybe specifically aware of it with some of the indigenous students, the way that they were writing, my first uh, look when I was reading it was, um, like, you can write like that in high school, but I don't know if you can write like that in a graduate program. That was the first thing. And, and it was because I was saying things like, um, you know, there are three arguments, and now I will present the first argument, and now I will present the second argument. Like, it, they were just kind of taking me through what they were doing. Um, in the paper, and from what I have learned in university, it's like you can kind of drop that. You, like, you just tell us what you need to say. You don't say, I'm now going to say what I'm going to say. But when I was thinking about it, it's like, well, that's a narrative way of writing. Like, there's nothing particularly wrong with that. It's not actually high school. It's like how it comes most naturally. And, and when I think about how this student is speaking to class, it's exactly like this. And it, it's like taking me through a story of moment by moment what is happening to them. And so, um, uh, so I was in this dilemma of like, do I say this is perfectly OK, which it is? Or do I also say to them, if you're going to be a planner and you're going to do this and you're going to do it for the municipality, they expect you not to say these things, because that I mean, in some way, I like them to know that information so that they can succeed and get to the top or whatever. But I am doing that within such a broken system. So like, do I prepare my students for the broken system? Or do I resist the broken system? What do I do with that? And, 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 I, and it's due at midnight, and I need to finish marking. You know? right. um, yeah. I was, I was just going to piggyback off of um, Aftab's point because if you want to look at a broken system, I think the legal no, the yeah. legal system is, is one that is close. yeah it, it's quite broken and and I think we I mean, and you struggle as a as a professor because you were trying to impart on students what they need to succeed in the profession, which is still stuck on some very old ways of, of writing and communicating, um, and but at the same time wanting to give them room to express themselves and to express the challenges that they have encountered with this, this broken system. And I think law is still trying to figure that out and, and find an answer um, um, to that. And some of the efforts um, to your question, Alana, that the law school is currently trying to undertake, um, a number of them are around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action um, because there was a specific call to action to law schools. Um, and so the Eller School of Law is trying to f figure out really how they, we can respond um, um, to that call to action um, and in, in other efforts as well recognizing the range of student perspectives and the students that come to law school um, we've included some workshops on trans inclusivity um, to encourage professors to be more cognizant of you know the different identities that students have um, and so encouraging professors to you know use their pronoun or, um, acknowledge the pronouns that they use and also to um, not presume students' pronouns and the um, preferred names that students would like to, to um, or not assume that you know students' name was necessarily jives with their, their gender and just to be more mindful uh, of, of those instances as well. But I think we, we still have a long way to go. Um, I'm myself, I'm trying to do some work around diversifying the student body itself because as I mentioned, there are very few black students. Um, I wouldn't want to 
give numbers because they're shockingly low. Um, so there's also work that needs to be done, I think, as well, and even just diversifying um, our student body. Um, but I'm hopeful. Um, otherwise, I really wouldn't be here, or I would, or I would be very depressed most of the time. <laughs> so I am still really hopeful that some of these things can be implemented. So something else that, um, and this is taking us back a little bit, I feel like I'm trying to follow the flow of conversation and then realizing that there's something that I left behind um, somewhere before. Um, we talked a little bit, I think, and I asked a question earlier around um, sort of what happens when there is a comment in the classroom that sort of needs to be addressed. And I'd like to go back to that a little bit because um, in some of the conversations that we've had in our work with faculty members and instructors, those moments of um, how do you respond in the moment and, and what happens when there's sort of a, a breakdown, especially a, amongst peers, potentially, right, amongst mm -hmm. students, um, comes up because I think a lot of uh, instructors feel like they're not, they haven't been well prepared or well equipped to deal with um, what I would call, you know, difficult or brave conversations, kind of different take on the same thing, right? And so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to what that has looked like in your classrooms the techniques that maybe you've used or what you've found successful, but also um, something that I think was mentioned uh, yesterday is the impact, right, and how we repair then what happened. So there's kind of two part that I see to the question. It's how, what do you do when that, a moment like that happens where there's an inappropriate comment that's made or some, whether that's coming from a place of ignorance or a place of resistance, right, to the material, what happens and what do you do as an instructor or facilitator in that moment but also, how do you repair the harm that that has caused in the classroom? And, um, and I think I, I'm thinking of that because of some of what was shared by students yesterday in terms of the impact that that has on them, right? When they sit in that space and potentially then the, and the lack of interest or willingness to go back to that space and not knowing what will happen. I think you have to be explicit about what guides your work. Uh, so you have to be explicit about your values. Um, in education, it's really important that our teacher candidates know that they hold personal values that are shaped by their background, by their family, by their experiences. And then they have professional values. And these are guided by human rights, they're guided by respect, equity, inclusion, all of the tenets that we hold dear in a uh, social justice forward institution. And it is their duty, it is their professional competency, and that's why we, we are framing a lot of the work in the faculty around this notion of professional competencies. Mm -hmm. It is their responsibility uh, as professionals to sometimes hold their own personal biases and uh, opinions to one side as they uphold their professional competencies. And these are guided by human rights. You know, it's, it's ensconced in law. And um, that's a fine line, but it's something that we can model as instructors by laying bare what, what those guidelines are, what those operating principles, shall we say, are, and then operate accordingly. And that is a way that you can both uh, preface your responses so that if something is that you hear or witness goes astray of those, you need to stop and say, well, this is what I was talking about. This is an instance of where, you know, we're going into this domain of personal bias and it, you don't frame it that way, personal opinion, let us say. And we need to now put on a professional competency framework and, and adjust. And so by doing that, you're, you're, you're not, you are making a judgment. It's your responsibility to do that. But you're giving a, a basis, a theoretical framework upon which to base that judgment and action. And then you move forward. And you can return to that because you can be sure there will be other instances where you need to bring that out again. And if you're clear at the onset and, and you have this as an explicit set of guidelines, you return to those again and again, and, and as you do so, you're modeling what teachers need to do all the time, whether they're here or whether they're in the K-12 system. So it's being clear about what, what those professional 
values and boundaries are. Thank you. Sometimes I think it, um, in at least in my classroom, it hasn't so much been the impact that a person's comment makes on others, uh, but more about other people's response to a particular student mm -hmm. who's making a comment. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and I'm, I'm particularly thinking about a student with a, uh, who speaks English with a foreign accent, a non-European accent in particular, um, often in psychology classrooms, uh, a vast majority of a vast number of our students are of uh, East Asian descent, and many of them uh, speak English as a second language, and many of them also have uh, accents when they speak English, uh, at least a, 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 an East Asian accent when they speak Eng uh, when they speak English, and often what I will um, experience is when a student speaking with that particular type of accent, asking a question or making a comment in class, I hear sighs. Um, or I hear people breathing deeply. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of like, which communicates to me that they're now disengaged. Uh, communicates to me that they don't care about what this person, what the student is talking about. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, there's this confounding of accent, accented speech and maybe the perceived validity of someone's comment or what the validity of someone's thoughts. Uh, and and that, that concerns me because um, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm an immigrant myself and I came here um, from Hong Kong when I was nine years old and I had spoken with an accent. Um, uh, un until I guess over time I more or less lost it. Uh, but you know, there's I, I'm I'm very aware of that conflation, uh, and and what that m feels like for the person to be speaking that, to be saying that, and to be expressing those that 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 accent. And so when I hear other people's response that like that kind of sighing response and disengaging response to the speaker uh, if anything I just I make sure to highlight how important that question was mm. um, and how much of a contribution that is making to the class discussion um, be because I don't want to just answer the question just like it's an, it's any other question because obviously the other students are responding to that question in a way that doesn't make it seem like any other question. Mm -hmm. And so I can't respond to it in the same way. Um, so I make it a point to that student to thank that student for asking that question um, and uh, to also highlight how that question is contributing to our class discussion, to our class knowledge. and. Um, uh, I've, I've had that happen several times over the last couple of terms in several classes. And I think over time, I started hearing less. I don't know whether they've just, the other, many other students have just sort of not explicitly uh, expressed their disengagement, um, but are still internally or privately expressing or experiencing disengagement. I don't know. But at least my purpose in that moment is protecting the student. Who is, uh, who, who is asking the question. And as long as there isn't as much of that expressed, explicit uh, frustration or disengagement, then I think that's, that's better for the student and better for participation. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. I wanted to speak to this question. It feels a little bit risky to, um, to say this is what I do and is it right or wrong, but um, uh, and I really appreciate the way that you've just spoke to it. I do, I mean, I, I really, I mean, I facilitate the heck out of my classes. I really, and, 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 and I've facilitated some, like I facilitated for the UN and these things between the federal government and First Nations. And sometimes those are, like, those are the chops I have to bring to my classroom. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's not easy what's happening in the classroom. 
Um, I, I do find myself often paraphrasing, amplifying the voices of the students you are talking about. Of uh, their, their question actually has a lot of, it's brilliant, but it is being said in a way that this room cannot hear or cannot hear well. And I can lend myself to raise that. And, lend my, and I will like, physically stand with them and repeat what they've said and, and amplify it. Um, I, there, so there is, so to me, I mean, mostly what I see, so there's probably every once in a while somebody who is, you know, just kind of awful and wants to violate others' human rights. I think that is possible, that that could happen. Mostly what I see is people not knowing, uh, is ignorance, or more kindly, not knowing, not knowing why it is wrong to say, to say something like that. And especially given where we come from all over the world, like there's no way that people are gonna land here as an international student two years ago and know all the norms of Canadian society and know what it means to use the right pronouns and know the history of the residential, you know, like it's just too much to ask. And we, and we are, yes, we need to teach them, and, but they're not trying to violate somebody else's right or hurt them on purpose or make it difficult for them. So. Um, I mean, I, I like and I, your your example at the beginning of um, like not knowing the the stories of this right. place, and so I mean, let's say that in my class there was a Hanai, and Hanai is saying, um, you know, why are we <laughs> hypothetically? <laughs> hypothetically, she's saying, you know, I I don't understand what the big deal is. Like maybe residential schools they were trying to do good things, right? Let's say that Hanai was saying that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so, yes, super uncomfortable and like very problematic and people could be negatively impacted by that. She's not meaning to hurt people, she just doesn't know. Um, and so, and the reality is, I mean, even though we are not saying it, there are many people in the society that actually think that. They don't know what was wrong with residential school or they have that objection to it. So to me, this is a moment where the conversation can be deepened instead of like left where it is. And so I would amplify that comment and, and with as much kind of kindness as I can of, uh, so th there is a view here of like, I actually don't understand what the big deal is, right? And, and, and I might even check with her or, or if I know she's a newcomer or doesn't have the history or something, note that. And then I might say like, what is the response to that? What do we want to say to that? And, and sometimes, and, and, and including, some, so sometimes people will say, well, I'm hurt by that because of this, because my family's gone through it, or because I've read this book and know this history, so, so education can happen around that issue. Other times people will say, well, actually, like, I just don't, I don't have energy for that conversation. Like, or I've had it a million times, I'm not having that. In which case I can say, you know, you and I can talk about it at my office hours or whatever. We don't need to necessarily do it in this classroom but there's at least that opportunity. I think the thing that's problematic is for a comment like that to just hang, mm -hmm. um, or, and or for this person to feel marginalized, not because of something wrong they're doing, but because of something ignorant that they're doing. Um, so again, I, I started by saying like, I do bring my, all my facilitation skills to do it, but I think it is, that is the real opportunity to deepen the conversation when those problematic statements come into the room. Well, I want to thank Aftab for uh, making yourself vulnerable. You, you said that you were a little uncomfortable to, uh, to share that, but I appreciate it very much. And so I wanted to um, honor that by perhaps being vulnerable myself and offering two things in response that um, uh, many people don't agree with me on. Uh, the first one is, is that I have never personally seen uh, shame-based approaches to challenging discrimination be effective or efficacious. I've never seen someone Twittered enough to be able to change their mind, uh, point of view. I've never seen somebody humiliated enough to, to change their racist ideas. I've never seen somebody uh, browbeaten enough um, with uh, moral righteousness to change their, their mindset. I have seen it silenced. I have seen people fired and, and disappeared. Um, but all that really assures for me is that it's going to be waiting there for our children to have to deal with. And so uh, because I'd rather it come at me and us and our generation than our kids, um, there's a different sort of sensibility that we want to bring to that and I, I appreciate that. And it's, 
asking an awful lot, and I, I hope that we all in the room have a sense of just how profound um, the folks on the, that I'm sitting with, uh, just the quality of instruction and, and compassion and, and uh, professional accomplishment that they bring to this. It's, uh, it's a lot to ask of people, and it's um, very humbling to be in the present of. One thing I think about a lot when I think about this idea of, of challenging discrimination or ignorance where it exists uh, is the idea of privilege. And uh, it's something that I think a lot about. And, and so I'll say the second thing that oftentimes people will disagree with me on. Um, if I'm giving a presentation, I'm talking to people, and I'm going to lose an audience, it'll be talking about privilege. That's not the thing that people disagree with me on. I think everyone can understand. It can be a difficult conversation for people. Oftentimes, it can feel very accusatory. And so my stance that people sometimes disagree with me on is that I don't think it's any of my business whether anyone in this room has privilege or not. It's not for me to point out. It's not for me to identify for you. It's not any of my business whatsoever. But my position is this. If privilege does exist, if there's anything in your life that you have that maybe other people haven't been able to enjoy, uh, my first thinking is that I don't want you to feel ashamed of that. And the second thing is that it can be a good thing to acknowledge that. It can actually be empowering and socially positive. I'll give you an example. My own daughter, who is um, status Indian, but growing up in a home where she has you know, an academic father and a, a mother who's the vice principal of a school, typical middle class Canadian enjoying more privilege than most of the world would ever know. And I don't want her to feel guilty about that. But if she ever looks down from her place of privilege and says, why don't they just go over that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or why don't they just work the way that I did? Or some other equally ignorant thing, I feel like I'll have failed her. Uh, my job is to sort of empower people, I think, to, um, to see the gifts that we've been given to, so I suppose, do good by other human beings. And, and I think that if we can sort of, you know, um, do exactly what you suggested, which is to sort of see people who are, are offering ignorant statements potentially as, as being, those being teachable moments or opportunities to empower a better way of relating to other people, then we have a different set of skills available to us. It's like that old saying that if uh, the only tool we have is a hammer, it's tempting to treat everything as if it's a nail. Um, if, uh, if we see um, ignorance as being an enemy rather than a constructive opportunity to create change, then I think it uh, offers a different set of tools. But I also wanted to uh, thank you for this beautiful blanket you, uh, you put on the table. You did a great job of setting up the sound system here. It looked very professional, mm -hmm. but I'm, I noticed that I was really enjoying this blanket, so I yeah. wanted to thank you for decorating the space with it. Thank you. Um, I just want to be mindful of time. Any final thoughts on, on that, that last conversation before we maybe turn to the audience for some additional questions? Maybe I could piggy jump in and then piggyback on the conversation that is happening right now. Um, it's like yesterday at the student panel, uh, some student, you know, you are talking about how you may kind of facilitate the moment and then, you know, protect some of the students who are being affected in the moment and things like that. But the students also did talk about the space, learning spaces where the instructor is not necessarily present. For example, small group, you know, assignments mm -hmm. or going into labs where the TAs keep rotating. And then so the instructor you know, cannot really reach and protect them all the way. Mm -hmm. and, and yet some you know, students do kind of appreciate if the peers, when something happened, if the, their peers stood, you know, showed up for them mm -hmm. and then supported mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But you know, when they, they were talking about it, I thought, well, then how do instructors set up that kind of classroom, kind of, you know, kind of maybe a sense of community, if you may call it, or, it's, you know, or develop some kind of guidelines or setting the norm or expectations. And would any of you here do something intentionally to create that kind of classroom environment where kind of everyone needs for each other to show up? answer the question just to break the silence because I hate awkward silences. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I think in, in my practice, um, no, I mean, there's a lot of individual work that's, that's done in, in, in my classes. Um, and whenever students do have to do any group work, I find that students do a great job. Um, I'll say great because I think it's, it's for their own well-being, but they do find a great job of, of finding their community 
and other like-minded students who will support them. Um, and, and so I, th I say it's great because they're being mindful of, of their own health and well-being, but it, on the other hand, it's, it's detrimental because then we're, we're really not, you know, having students really engage with people with diverse and, and different perspectives. Um, and so I think that's still something I, I struggle to do as, as a professor because I would want students to find, you know, their, their little clan, their little community that can support them um, in my classroom and, of course, in their three years at law school because it is, the law school can be a very oppressive place. Um, but I think then there are some students who are leaving a law school without the diversity of perspectives that they really should be and are entering the profession without that breadth of perspectives that they should be. So mm -hmm. still something I'm, I'm struggling with. So maybe I have to take more classes with AFTAB to learn more <laughs> about ways to, to, to do that. Then maybe we can open the conversation to the floor. Um, so if you have any questions to the panelists, and then just to remind, um, again, um, if you are participating on live stream, please use the hashtag CLW2019, or even if you are in this room, if you'd rather want to participate that way, please feel free to. And but yes? Do we have some mics oh, yeah, microphone uh, going runners. around the room? Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, for the live audience, it's helpful yes. to use the mics for anyone else. I'm Italian and American, so volume is not a problem, usually. For me. Yeah. Um, first of all, Manel, I, your, boy, your voice is so beautiful. So for the, the moment you spoke, I thought, gosh, she has the most beautiful voice. And then you said you're on radio. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll pay you later some, for that. Some things, some things are right in this world. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for your perspectives. I don't know how to phrase my question, so bear with me. I um, am a non-Indigenous or Indigenous-impaired first person <laughs> working in an, an Indigenous space, so I recognize the value of allies. And I have been at UBC for about three years. I feel like I've gone to every CTLT event uh, around <laughs> microaggressions or pedagogies or Indigenous content in classrooms, and I am just struck over the three years of how little uh, or how few men are coming to these sessions. I know I've talked to you, Ben, about this. I'm like, is there a psychological <laughs> reason for this? But um, I don't know how to phrase my question. I'm wondering if anyone else is concerned about this, even looking around this room. I, why are so few men coming to events like this, um, not to like make it a, a sexist thing? I just looked up figures and you know, 91% of deans at UBC are men. 77% of heads of department are men, so I feel like, and that's from 2014, I don't know why it's not more current. So I'm just kind of curious, <laughs> and I don't know what to do because I feel like this is a critical component of this conversation. I, you know, I know we're the converted, I know we're the, cho the choir, I know we're the engaged, but like what do we do for those who are not maybe the converted or not engaged, and how do we have more active participation from those who are not here? In a way, I want to say I'm not too worried about it because all the men are in the conflicts and they're coming to me anyway. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the thing is, like, there's no escaping these issues. And the department heads and deans who are mostly men, uh, I mean, this, if, if you, they don't proactively get some of this stuff, they get it when things go wrong. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, it's their loss, you know, like it would be probably really good to, and, and not, not to say that we shouldn't make more efforts for them to be in this room, but at this point I think like this, these conversations are uh, unavoidable, unescapable, and in fact I, I've enjoyed conflict as a way of um, having the people who really need to be in the room, being in the room with a stake, you know, as opposed to the, the usual suspects which we often get if we are proactive about things. If I can offer something in that regard, and I don't want to uh, presume to be speaking for anyone else, um, just to offer a little bit of, of maybe my own perspective on, on that question. I, I spoke to this a little bit this morning when I said that I was raised by men who had some pretty 
uncomfortable, uh, problematic ideas about masculinity. And part of that translated to misogyny, to be honest with you. And I don't say that to upset anyone, and please forgive me for saying anything that might be uncomfortable. But that was the reality that I grew up in. And it was very hurtful for me to even think back on some of the ideas that I was surrounded by and even some of the things that I was guilty of saying. And when I first went to university, one of my first courses that I took was an English course because nothing else was available. And I walked into a course not really understanding what I was signing up for, and it ended up being a course on feminist literature. And my professor at the time was a uh, uh, brilliant academic by the name of Keith Louise Fulton. And what uh, you know, she presented was this first time I mentioned the word privilege. It was the first time that she introduced me to that word. And the first time I heard it, I was profoundly offended uh, by the suggestion that I had male privilege. Mm. Because I thought in my own head at that time with my very narrow world view, how dare you suggest that I didn't struggle to be where I am now, that I haven't faced my own struggles. And of all the ways that she could have responded to me, um, that she would have been, that would have been permissible, she could have kicked me out of the class for my ignorance, she could have shamed me, she could have humiliated me, uh, humiliated me in front of my peers, um, she didn't. Instead, she created a space for exactly what we've been talking about here to sort of engage with me in a way that allowed me to sort of be vulnerable with my own ideas and to continue or consider a different point of view. And she stayed with me on this journey where uh, by offering me respect, uh, I was able to feel safe enough with my own misunderstandings to be able to think critically about this. And in returning after, you know, we had established that relationship back to this idea of privilege, uh, I was able to come to the realization, much to my surprise, that absolutely I do live with a profound privilege being male that absolutely hasn't been afforded to my sisters. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't in any way invalidate my experiences growing up or my struggles, but what it does suggest is that there have been doors that have been opened to me because I am male for no other reason than the fact that I am. And so moving forward with that, with that um, sort of knowledge, I've sort of reflected upon some of the other ideas that I grew up with about what it meant to be a man. And, if I'm working with kids, for example, one of the things that I'll say uh, to young boys in particular is, um, you know, as we engage with some of these issues, I want you to remember that it's very masculine to cry and show emotion and to be vulnerable. As I still think a lot of boys, particularly indigenous males, because of the circumstances oftentimes that we grew up with, grew up with this idea that we need to be strong, and strong means being violent, or strong means showing very little, no human emotion, no vulnerability in terms of our uh, soul, in terms of our emotionality, in terms of those things that really humanize us as human beings. Um, and I suppose where it would be easy to be angry at people for being as ignorant as we see sometimes, I really see it as a suffering. And so I've been trying to um, sort of demonstrate um, with young men in particular uh, that vulnerability and that emotionality, that ability to be present. Um, but I think that part of the message that keeps men away from some of these conversations is that unwillingness to engage in a space that is emotional, that is vulnerable, that does um, sort of ask us to tap into a different reality than maybe the one that we are uh, imposing on ourselves as these awful ideas of masculinity that are really choking the vibrancy out of the contribution that we could be making otherwise. And so maybe it's another opportunity to engage with an exercise of healing, perhaps. Um, as, as maybe another point of view. But I will say this, that um, uh, I also share your optimism and your hope because part of my journey of healing from my own sort of toxic mas masculinity, if you will, is coming to remember and reflect and ground myself in the reality that I come from a matriarchal society. And what I mean by that is that it was always traditionally women that were uh, held the responsibility for leadership and guidance for that community. And so when I sit with sisters, um, I'm reminded of a profound power um, that has the potential to really transform um, the world around us in, in ways that maybe, you know, uh, straight academic power could never accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful for that. But I'm also sort of reflecting on the idea that um, in 1871, when Treaty 1 was signed, which is where Winnipeg exists, where I have my homeland, um, women were turned away from that treaty negotiation because women were not seen as having a voice in political mm -hmm. affairs. So we have this rejection of feminist ideas coming from Ojibwe communities. If you fast forward to 2019, we have over 2,000 missing and murdered women who should be at home with their families tonight but won't be. Most were victims of people that they knew. And so I think that sexism and, and homophobia and uh, uh, toxic masculinity, again, are, are, are impositions of colonization that I think that if we can engage with the calls to action in a, in a good way are going to benefit everybody and maybe allow us to enjoy more vibrancy on our campuses. Please forgive me if anything I said was upsetting.
Hi folks, my name is Netta. I'm a graduate student uh, in nursing and public health. Um, I really appreciate the space because as a racialized woman on campus, I don't feel I have a lot of spaces to talk about uh, my experience as a graduate student. Um, and so I, I have a question, but I want to give some context to it because Aftab, as you said, um, a, a lot of the time we talk about this more intellectually as, a, as opposed to personally. So for me, being in graduate school, it's a very personal experience. Um, I come from a country where my parents uh, were not able to access education as freely as I am, so I'm very privileged to be here. The, you know, during the time my uh, dad was going to school, there was a revolution and a war going on, so there was some barriers there. And so coming to graduate school, I feel really, really humbled and really privileged because as much as I think that education is a right, um, it's not yet for everybody. And so um, I immigrated to this country when I was six years old, and uh, you know, as a lot of immigrants and, and people who might not be born here uh, understand that, it takes a lot, a lot of time to uh, deal with the um, emotional trauma of immigration and you know, identity crises and whatnot. And I have to say, um, when I came to graduate school, I was very um, hurt and sad and disappointed because I felt like for the first time after 22 years of living in this country, I had to question if I actually belong here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm in the School of Nursing and Public Health. Um, I've practiced nursing for almost six years now. I've treated racialized people, uh, many racialized people. Uh, as you know, I work in Emerge and we have a lot of people of color come in. Um, and I've, I've practiced in indigenous communities, so remotely in BC as well, and I understand the uh, barriers that a lot of people face accessing healthcare in our country. And I um, saw a lot of the ways that uh, racialized people or, or sort of uh, you know, marginalized identities in, gener uh, in general, so non-binary non folks, transgender folks, and the intersectionality of those identities, how they are um, othered in, in uh, healthcare. And so when I came to graduate school, I, I realized that um, there's not a lot of, of uh, marginalized identities in faculty. And I started to realize where some of these problems um, arise in our healthcare system. There might be something to think about there. And um, you know, having to carry the burden of working and going to school, but at the same time constantly trying to find mentors constantly trying to look for places where I can say what I want to say and not feel like this might affect my grade or how I'm seen on campus or in my faculty and, and my ability to succeed. Um, and so I, I guess I kind of want to ask for, I know a couple people on the panel mentioned that they had similar experiences when they were in graduate school. And how, like, what are your words of um, almost wisdom for coping? Because this isn't going to change, you know, today, right, with these conversations. This is a long-standing issue. Colonialism is going to take hundreds <coughs> of years to dismantle, just like it took hundreds of years to build. So how do we cope on this campus um, that wasn't built for us to be here? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, can, I don't mind sharing my experience because I definitely relate to, to what you're, you said. Um, you, you're, you come from a very strong family. I can imagine immigrating to Canada is, is not a piece of cake. I mean, my family also immigrated from, from war and from famine. So I, I totally understand. Um, so it's already in you, the strength to persevere. So just keep persisting. Um, and I hope, whether it's in your faculty or in an, another part of the university, that you can find some safe space so that you can, um, you can vent, you can be yourself. Um, because it, that is, I mean, that's something that is critical to your well-being. Um, I've, thankfully, I think I've been able to do that for some students at the law school. Um, and when I go home, I, I have a great partner who celebrates my blackness, um, and we, we thrive in it, and we, we find things um, to enjoy um, together because he's an immigrant as well, and he's had to struggle with the immigrant experience in this country. Um, so we find things that bring us joy and, and celebrate those things as often as we can because it is very taxing coming to this campus every day and wanting to be your full self but knowing sometimes you just can't when you have to bite your tongue in certain meetings or in your classroom because you just don't want to say that comment and be known as that person. Um, and so once you're out of that space, 
Uh, for me, it's blasting Beyonce as often as I can, because she brings me so much joy. Um, and whenever there's basketball on TV, I just gotta watch, because that also brings me joy. So find something that, that, can, that brings you joy and, and helps you persist, because it's in you, and, and I'm sure you can keep doing it. Um, and Aftab said she was willing to mentor, so <laughs> if you need <laughs> safe spaces, I'm signing up to Aftab. But I'm, I'm also, ha you, if you want to grab coffee, like send me an email at any point in time. I'm really happy to, to just share um, my experiences and, and give you an opportunity to just speak with a friendly person on campus. I, uh, Sometimes I feel like the luckiest person on the face of the world and that I come from a people who are capable of withstanding anything. Uh, and I shared this this morning that, uh, you know, I feel such a sense of, of pride in recognizing that um, residential school survivors as children face the very worst that Canada has been guilty of and yet still somehow found it inside of the strength and voice of the ancestors and the culture uh, in the spirit um, to grow to be the kind of people that could extend their hand in friendship back to Canada. Um, feels me so much pride and makes me feel so good inside and reminds me that indigenous peoples across Canada are capable of facing any challenge. Now, I, I don't know anything about your cultural background but um, I know that you come from the same strength too and uh, you know I, I'm so lucky that I'm able to connect to um, you know the, the, uh, the Sundance and receive the healing from the Thunderbirds in the summertime and to be able to go to the, the sweat lodge but um, you know I, I think that uh, one of the things that we can do is um, you know, recognize that uh, as children of Medeaki, a kind-hearted Mother Earth, that uh, we were born uh, capable of incredible strength and resilience and that um, uh, you carry the strength of your ancestors in you and, and, uh, and how proud they are of you for being here because you said it, everything inside of this was designed to keep you uh, out of the system and yet here you are and persist and that's incredibly beautiful and inspiring. Holy smokes, the impact that you're going to have on future people as role models is, is unbelievable. I um, just wanted to uh, thank the panel. You guys are amazing. Um, and many of you are talking about compassion um, as a kind of a pedagogical mode. And I agree, and I feel like that is an awesome way to come at things. This year, we had a sessional who was teaching a transliteracy course. And the sessional was having a meltdown, really, and couldn't continue in the course because there was a group of people um, that were actively sabotaging the course. And it was, in this case, I would say ignorance was um, not really, it was very political in the sense that they chose not to know um, what the experiences of trans people and others were. So I took over the class and I walked into the back row of people all in MAGA hats, which did not spark joy, I must say. But, um, you know, about nine or ten of them with MAGA hats. And so I'm just wondering, you know, I, I don't know that I handled it in an awesome kind of way, but um, it's, it, you know, I think that there, are, there is a kind of element also here that it's not about talking and it's not about compassion. It might be about naming, you know, this is racist, this is inappropriate, this is... And I'm seeing a little bit more, but it also could be because I'm in a social justice institute and we're maybe, you know, getting a few more incidents like this. But our faculty, I think in some ways pay a heavy price um, because they are constantly having to educate and constantly having to have these conversations and not talk about you know how awesome Milton is or some other thing. Well, not that Milton is awesome, but you know, whatever. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. So I'm just wondering if anybody has any thoughts on that. What, you're right, Janice. I mean, there's a point at which, and maybe that's because I've spent quite a bit, a few years in administration lately, that I keep coming back to guidelines, and we are bound by human rights guidelines, and that's not okay. And so naming it is not okay. However, respectfully, we do it in our classrooms, um, and sometimes we do it aside as an, from an administrative perspective or you bring an administrator in to help has to happen because that message 
is a message to the perpetrator, but it's a far more powerful message to everyone else around that you actually stand up for your, you, you've explicitly stated your values and guidelines and then you've held to them. And I, I think that's completely defensible, uh, particularly if everyone is on board and you just say at the onset of a course, you know, these are the guidelines that, that um, govern conduct in this, in this class and then you live by them and you ensconce them in your syllabus and then you, you name it and you deal with it. And if someone is not abiding by and is not willing to abide by the guidelines of the course, they don't have a right to continue in it. So good for you for defending and, and supporting someone in distress. Good for you for even knowing about it. Because sometimes these things are happening, these, and that's not a microaggression, that's full on. Happen and nobody shares. They suffer alone or they suck it up because they feel that they, they can't complain. So we, we have guidelines, and we need to uh, enforce them. That's a hard line from an administrator, so other comments? <laughs> yeah, I, I want to add, I mean, essentially I agree. The, the metaphor of um, the hammer has already been used, and I kind of think um, the law or the policy or the guidelines are the hammer. I don't want to use it very often. Like, uh, you know, most of my tools are... I don't know, shovels, and gardening <laughs> kind of tools, right? Oh. But like every once in a while I need a hammer, right? Mm -hmm. As long as it's not everything becomes right. a nail, right. right? Because it's actually that way of saying this actually doesn't belong, you know, this is a, a line has been crossed and this doesn't belong in this classroom is a line we need to draw. I think if, actually if we include absolutely everything, no entity can survive. Um, so we do need to draw these lines. I just, uh, I think the, what the panel has expressed is like that is a hammer that we keep in the back of our pocket and use only as necessary. That's how I, I see it. Thank you. We have just only a few minutes left, so um, is there any quick question in the room? Um. Hi, my name is Steve Mulligan, and uh, I just wanted to uh, mention one of the things that Dr. Carr uh, mentioned, and it came up yesterday in the in the student panel, and that was the idea. We we've been working on a video uh, which talks about um, inclusion across campus, specifically around sexual orientation and gender identity, but uh, many other types of inclusion are relevant as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, both the Dean of Medicine mentioned in, in his interview with us and the Dean of Education was the idea of professional competencies. And it may be a bit of an elephant in the room because of academic freedom, etc. Yesterday in the um, student panel, someone mentioned the idea of instructors, university instructors, having to go through um, a course or, or some sort of, uh, sort of prerequisite of, of learning about harassment. And my question is, what about the idea of professional competency around inclusion for university instructors? And would that, is that something that could fly? And how in a university setting? Sarah Jane just shrunk in her seat there. <laughs> No, no, no. No, I'd, I'd, I'd actually be looking over to you for comment about that. Oh, sure. It should be the mic. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you. Steve, that's a really good question and um, uh, something actually that we're in active discussions about. Um, it's certainly um, easier to think about doing that um, for staff positions, putting in some kind of requirement for inclusion skills or uh, baseline diversity competencies that have to be fulfilled. Um, it is a little bit more difficult with instructors, um, uh, but it um, is, is, an, is a live conversation in terms of having expectations around equity and inclusion. Um, and it may be that the way we get to that at first is through um, rewarding inclusive teaching practices and so um, finding ways in which uh, to enhance um, the, the uh, esteem of people uh, who are doing that kind of work through rewarding it in our um, merit and tenure and promotion policies. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah Jane. So 
with that, um, I'm aware of the time, and I'd like to continue the conversations. And but you know, the, I have to be res respectful of the, your time. So uh, I'd like to close by thanking everyone here, especially the panelists, for taking the time and then sharing your wisdom and experiences. That's so wonderful. So thank you, and thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>